Here we go with First Peter. Uh, we're we're going to be in First Peter the entire time. We're going to jump. There's some other scriptures that are on um, your paper as well. You'll notice on the notes this time, I turned them landscape for you, gave you the outline, and then left a section blank on the side for you to be able to write your own notes in. Up to you how you want to use that. If you want to jot down questions while we're going and then raise your hand to ask them, that's totally up to you. If you want to fill in some details, that's up to you. If you want to make a grocery list, I guess that's your prerogative too. But that's that's that section is yours for whatever you need it for. Okay? Um, we are studying First Peter, and we are calling this the imperishable hope. That's the name of the study. Because that's what Peter writes about in his first letter. Tonight, we're going to be in the first 12 verses. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 12 is where we will pick up tonight. So, before we get uh, going, are there any questions or thoughts before we read these first 12 verses? I was interested in doing a little study on my own different things. But, sure. Study on the names of all the different people in the Bible, like how many Peters, how many James, the different names they were given. So yeah. Can you go a little bit over the names that Peter went by? Yeah, so um, I can. Um, yeah, so when we're first introduced to Peter, which I'll tell you about here in Matthew 4, um, he's called Simon. And Peter, okay, kind of like a. Um, Now, I don't really know how to describe it, just like a first like surname, second name, the way he was either called Simon or he was called Peter. Like my son's name is John, but we also call him Jack, okay? But then he also went by Cephas, which means rock, and uh, a lot of people believe that his declaration of you are the Christ, the Son of God, the Catholics have taken that and ran with it to mean that he is you know, the first pope and every pope has descended from him. Building off of that idea of his name being the rock or Cephas. Um, but really, we're just talking about Simon Peter is who we're talking about. The, uh, the man who was born with the proverbial foot in his mouth consistently. Okay. Um, and so we'll, we'll see a little bit of that tonight because we are going to look at in this introduction, these first couple of verses. Who is Peter? Who's he writing to? And then he gives us his thesis statement, basically, in, uh, in verse number two. And then in verse three, he starts to build on that thesis statement. So before we get going, uh, I think as is appropriate, we should um, ask the Lord to bless our time. Before we do pray, though, I do want to remind everybody that each week after these sessions are taught, they are being recorded and they'll be up on the Valor Men's YouTube page. So if you end up missing a week, you can go to the YouTube page and um, and see the lesson that you missed, and then you'll be caught up. The notes are also posted there um, in the description. If you need help navigating there, I can help you on a Wednesday night, or you can just go to the church's website, go to ministries, men's ministries, and there's a link to the YouTube page right from uh, thebeaconbaptist.com. So let's get praying. Let's get studying, and let's look at this imperishable hope that Peter talks about. So pray with me, if you will. God, I love you, and I thank you for tonight. And I thank you for bringing us here together. Every face that is here is here by your appointment, God, and we praise you and thank you for that. I pray that you would be with our time tonight, God, that your Son would be glorified, that your Spirit would meet with us to bring the scriptures to life for us, that you would quiet our minds, that you would calm our hearts so that we can hear from you, so that we may know you better. We pray all of these things through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go. Why would we call, why would we call the study of 1 Peter an imperishable hope? Well, part of the reason, go ahead. Well, it kind of was. I guess I did ask it as a question. Didn't even give you a chance to answer. So. Uh, I think Chad added, uh, uh, didn't Nero just blame the burning of Rome on the Christians? Okay. So he was uh, kind of a pet top, right? To, uh, 
meet with the Gentiles and the Jews and to get with them and to kind of put things forward and to assure them that uh, they're doing the right thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. There's definitely some um, extracurricular activities going around the churches at this time. If you were part of our seven churches study where we looked at the seven churches of Revelation, we know that there's trial and tribulation that is going on. But one of the things that Peter is going to deal with specifically is our salvation. And that salvation is something that never perishes. That because we have this salvation and because God has chosen to save us, there is a hope that never fades away. There is hope that amid whatever trials or tribulations you may face in this life, your salvation is sure. He kind of reiterates the promise that Jesus left us with that I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Well, the reason he's with us always is because we have salvation given by his death, burial, and, re and resurrection. So, Let's look at 1 Peter. We're going to read the first 12 verses, and then we're going to go, like I said, verse by verse to break this down and, and, and kind of meet this out a little bit. So here we go. 1 um, first, first Peter chapter 1, verse 1 says this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, is this book written by Peter or addressed to Peter? Okay, written by Peter. That's, that's correct. Because in ancient letter writing, this is the form that they would take. The author always signed their name right at the beginning. So this is Peter writing to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappad Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, though it perishes being tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with a joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith and the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, Peter writes, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. <coughs> it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through these who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look." That's the section of scripture that we will be dealing with tonight, the first 12 verses of Peter. So let's go back to verse 1 and let's just go through it. Number 1, we see who the author of 1 Peter is. Well, it is who? Peter. Peter, okay? That was an easy one. That was like the alley-oop of all alley-oops. If you missed that slam dunk, we were in trouble, okay? But Peter qualifies himself. He says... I'm Peter writing to you, and I'm writing to you on the authority of one who is what? Apostle. An apostle, but not just an apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ, okay? So let's deal with that. Let's talk about Peter. Who was Peter? Fisherman. He was a fisherman, okay? And we can actually read about Peter and his call to discipleship 
in Matthew 4. And I do want to look at that section of Scripture because there are some things, and I was... I was doing some research on this because I've heard a couple of different things. There's, there's some people who believe that there were a number of different levels of schooling that Jewish children went through, okay? However, throughout the, the studies that I did, I could not find any real good scholarship to verify these claims, okay? But the thought was is that there's these three different schools. At about age six or seven, students would go to the first school. It was the school of the book, where they would learn the Torah. Now, do we know what the Torah is? It's the first five books of the Old Testament. But they wouldn't just study it like we study it in like a Bible college or a seminary. They memorized it. Okay? Memorized. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Wow. Okay? It's a lot to remember. And unlike American education, where everybody just passes, regardless of how well they do, that's a discussion for another time, okay? The best of the best were able to go on to the next school. If you were not part of that group, then you just went and start, started taking up the family business. Then in the next set of schooling, what would happen is you would memorize the rest of the Old Testament, okay? So by the end of the time you were about 14 years old, you would have 39 books committed to memory. That's significant, okay? But it wasn't just a matter of like rote memorization where you would just, you know, two plus two equals what? Four. We know that because we've memorized that, right? But they would also engage in like philosophical discussions, and then again, school number three was the best of the best from that school number two moved on. The rest went into the family business. And then in school number three is where you went and tried to attach yourself to a rabbi, to a teacher. You would become a disciple of that rabbi. Okay. So when we meet Jesus in Matthew 4, going and talking to Simon Peter and his brother, what are they doing? Fishing. Fishing. Which according to that school of thought tells us what? They were in the family business. And not part of and not part of the elite of the elite when it came to education. Okay? Which gives you an interesting insight when you read. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. They had taken up the family business. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And the next word is what? Immediately. Immediately. Mm -hmm. You've got Jewish kids who have been looking for a rabbi to follow, who were told probably for a number of years of their life they weren't the best of the best, they have a rabbi calling them to follow them. So the word immediately makes sense. Question to you, basically. And I've heard other people talk about this. By what you just stated, the disciples were the ones around Galilee. Do you believe that all the Jewish children knew how to read, being that they had to memorize those scriptures? So Some that... People say they, they weren't... Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of in when I was talking to you about studying this and trying to figure out like what was uh, going on with this schooling, that was kind of the pervading thought is that even if these three schools weren't verified, we still know that people were educated. So how were they educated? Well, they were educated within their home through oral tradition, through you know mothers and, and fathers maybe attempting to teach them how to read and write. And we know that they were at least literate because in the ancient world, in order to spread the gospel, the apostles wrote letters. And I must say, sitting here in 2023, I'm really glad they wrote letters, right? Because then those letters were preserved for us so that we too might know who our creator is. Okay? So there was a level of education. Do we know to what level that education was? No, probably not. And it for sure looked different than the education that we are 
familiar with. However, if you read Jewish historians like Josephus, he will tell you that education was fundamental to the Jewish way of life. So whether that happened in a formal school setting or whether that happened inside the home, education was thought of to be very important. But there's some other things that we know about uh, Peter for, uh, through the gospel accounts. If you read in Matthew 14, 28, he's the only disciple that stepped out of the boat to walk on the water with Jesus. He didn't last long, but he, and he kind of gets a bad rap, right? Because everybody's like, oh, you should have kept your eyes on Jesus. This was the only one that stepped out of the boat. Thank you. Right? So at least there's some courage in this guy. Okay? For sure. Absolutely. There is that lesson within that. But a lot of times we give the other disciples a pass for staying in safety, right. Right? right? As opposed to being like, can we maybe be a little bit more like Peter who swung his legs over the boat and at least attempted to walk on the water, right? Yeah, he kept his eyes off. He didn't keep his eyes on Jesus, and there is absolutely that lesson, but at least he did it, right? Okay, then what, what else do we see? We also see that we already talked about this, the confession that... that uh, Peter made about Jesus Christ in Matthew 16. You read that in verses 13 through 20, where Christ just simply asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. That word Christ is the, the, the Greek term for Messiah. You are the promised one, the Son of God. And Jesus says, upon this rock, this foundation, I will build my church. Not on the man, but on the statement that he made, and the Christian church has been built on the fact of, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or not? If you do not, you are not a Christian, okay? Let's not mince words there. It's a fundamental doctrine, and we talked about it in the doctrine of Christ. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you, you cannot be a Christian, okay? That goes into the confessing part that we talked about with repentance and confession and salvation. Peter was also part of that inner circle of Jesus who was present at the transfiguration. You can read about that in Matthew 17. He also boldly, even though incorrectly, defended Jesus with a sword in the garden. Now, if you read this account, it's found in all four Gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not name the disciple, which I find very interesting. Matthew, probably because he didn't really want to throw Peter under the bus. Mark, for sure, because he was kind of a follower of Peter and kind of Peter's, you know, handwriter in a lot of ways. He got his gospel account from Peter is what we believe traditionally. So he's clearly not going to throw Peter under the bus. Luke, I don't know why he didn't include him, but I know why John included him, right? Because we always read through the Gospel of John, John is kind of in a little bit of a competition with Peter, right? When you read the account of them going to the tomb, John says, the two of us ran to the tomb and I got there first, right? Or I'm the disciple that Jesus loved, right? So of course, John throws Peter under the bus like, this dude pulled out a sword and cut off a guy's ear. And Jesus said, what are you doing? Right? So we know that Peter was the one that cut off Malchus's ear in the garden. We also know that around the time that Christ was crucified, Peter, who said that he would die by the sword for Christ, fulfilled Jesus' promise that he would deny him three times. Okay? And then we also, if we read through Acts, you find the account of God giving Peter the command that the gospel is for the Gentiles. He falls into a trance and he sees all these unclean meats and God tells him to rise, kill, and eat. And he goes, Lord, I've never touched these from my youth. And God says, what I've called clean, do not call unclean. And if you read through other, God, uh, other epistle accounts like Galatians, you see that him and Paul kind of had a little bit of a rivalry as well because Paul will say in Galatians that I stood toe to toe with Cephas telling him that you cannot add to the gospel. Because at a point, Peter was saying, well, you can become a Christian, but you also have to be circumcised like the Jews. And, and Paul goes, hold on, buddy. We're going to square off in a minute if you don't get this right. 
okay? But for all of the ups and downs of Peter's life, and for all of the things that we know about Peter, he's definitely bold. He's definitely courageous. He was definitely born with a foot in his mouth that needed to be surgically removed a couple of times. But yet at the end of the day, he was faithful. And at the end of the day, when it came to writing this letter, he knew where hope came from. He knew that regardless of circumstances and trial, our salvation is sure because of the man that he followed for three and a half years. He knew that our hope was secured. So let's talk about this. That's just the first word of the letter. So congratulations, right? Um, the next set, the apostle of Jesus Christ. Apostle is a Greek word, apostolos, which is, you can find it in Strong's con Concordance in G649. That's the, the, the Strong's number for it, which basically means this, a delegate, specifically an ambassador of the gospel, officially a commissioner of Christ. He that is sent. Now, we will say that in order to be a, an apostle, you had to be one that was specifically commissioned by Christ and had to be an eyewitness of him, which John talks about in his first letter, in 1 John. He talks about the things that I've seen with my eyes, that I've, that I've touched with my hands. And Peter, even here, we're going to read in chapter 5, verse 1, talks about being an eyewitness. And a, he talks about being a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, okay? The second half of verse one, he talks about who the audience is. He says, to the elect exiles in the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, okay? The, these elect exiles, this is a reference to exiles. It's not a specific exile, meaning it's not people who have been barred from their home, but the way in which he uses this, because he's talking about Gentiles in this section, he's talking about all of us who are exiles on this earth. Because our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. So when he talks about being an elect exile, yet, <clears throat> yes, he uses the word elect. Yes, we discussed that word in the doctrine of salvation, that it is part of God's sovereignty in our salvation, and it works with the whole predestination and adoption aspect of our salvation, but it does not mitigate our responsibility of faith, okay? But he is talking specifically about people who are saved as Gentiles. We are exiles in this world because our citizenship lies elsewhere, elsewhere. We are children of the King, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, Paul will tells us, which tells us that our citizenship does not lie and is not bound to this earth. Okay? He talks about the dispersion, or in the Greek, dysphoria which does refer to the spreading out of Jewish people across the earth. You're gonna, you, if you study the Bible for any amount of time, you will come across this dysphoria that has happened numerous times throughout the Bible, right? The, the kingdom of Israel was split into two, where you ended up with the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And then ultimately, those kingdoms were conquered as well, and people were driven out. The entire book of Daniel is a book about the dysphoria, because Daniel and his buddies were taken to Babylon. But that dysphoria continues to happen. Now, when he's talking here about the dispersion, he is also referencing the church of Christ, which has been dispersed throughout the world. All right? Last week when we talked in our doctrine study of the doctrine of last things and we said there was that sign fulfillment of all nations hearing the gospel of Christ, that cannot happen unless there are Christians dispersing that gospel. So that's why he references the dispersion here. And then he names specific places, Pontus, Galatia, okay, Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia. And most likely this is just a roadmap for who will be the courier of this letter. See, in ancient times, 
They didn't have a printing press. The printing press wasn't invented until around Martin Luther's time in the 1500s by a guy named Gutenberg. So every copy of a letter, if there was ever going to be a copy of a letter, it had to be handwritten. So most of the time, these manuscripts would be handed to a courier from the author and say, go here, 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 and here. And they would take it to those churches in those cities. They would read this letter from the apostle, maybe copy it down so they had a copy for when it left. But the original would then go on with the messenger. And you actually read in chapter 5, verse 2, who that courier is. His name's Sylvanus, okay? But then we get into the message and the purpose of this entire letter. Anybody knows if you write a paper in school, it has to have a good opening. But a good opening means nothing if you don't have a thesis statement, right? Because your thesis statement tells your reader exactly what your message is going to be in that paper. Well, he says, to these elect exiles, and he's saying, this is to you according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, for, for is kind of a purpose word, right? This is what I'm writing, for, for, and what's the command? Obedience, obedience to what? Because we can be obedient to a number of things. Obedience to the blood, of Christ. the blood of Christ, Jesus Christ. Okay? So that is the purpose of this message. But, and we're going to go back to our doctrine study a little bit. What do we notice about who he references in this verse? Trinity. Mm. Say it louder for those in the back. The Trinity. The Trinity. We've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit right here. The nature and work of the triune God right here as the purpose for P Peter's letter. I keep wanting to say Paul, but it is Peter. We'll get to Paul all next year when we talk about R Romans, okay? But Peter invokes the name of the, the, the Holy Trinity. This is according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, again, referencing their salvation. We talked about this. If you want to read about foreknowledge, you read about it in Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. This deals with God's sovereignty, and it deals with his ability to be outside of time completely. Okay? When we talk about the foreknowledge of God, we have to understand, and we have to realize, our lives exist on a timeline. Correct? From the day that we were born until the day that we die, we think of things like this. One line stretched out and events happened in between. Okay, if you're part of the Marvel Universe, there's like seven timelines, but that's, that's not us, okay? There's one timeline, and our time moves linearly, okay? It moves, Tuesday always comes after Monday, Wednesday always comes after Tuesday, 2023 comes after 2022. July comes after June, right? That's how our time works. God is not bound by our timeline, okay? So when we talk about God's foreknowledge, we are talking about God who sits above the timeline. There is no beginning. There is no end. It is His existence, okay? He interacts with us on the timeline. But there is no time when we are referring to God. That's why I believe it's the psalmist will say that a day in your courts is like a thousand, right? Because there is no time when it comes to, to God, okay? That's the foreknowledge. The sanctification. We've talked about sanctification. This can refer to our moment of conversion, but it also refers to our continual growth to be more like Christ. We've talked about kind of that process of salvation, right? We have our conversion moment where we come to faith or faith is given as a gift for us. And our salvation continues through what's known as the process of sanctification. And if you were here for when Jared taught in the big house a couple weeks ago, he talked about sanctification, but it's the continual process 
of becoming more and more like Christ until we get to heaven and are glorified. Okay? And then we're looking for, and the, the purpose of this letter is for obedience to Jesus Christ. Because as Christians, our number one job is what? It is to tell others about Jesus, but that flows from obedience. Why? Because he gave us the command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? Paul will tell us, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Right? It's our job to obey. Obey. Exactly. While we do that, our, our faith increases, our sanctification grows, right? We're coming into a deeper knowledge of who God is because at the end of the day, Christianity is about seeking God. And we cannot seek God if we are disobedient, okay? It also is a form of our sanctification. So let's get into the meat of this. Verses 3 through 12, this is where Peter's going to start building this case. And there is a little bit of criticism among, among modern scholars, because modern scholars like to criticize everything, as far as the authorship of this book went. Because they said, oh, this, the theology of this book, it's too similar to Paul, so it can't be Peter because it's not distinct enough, right? Because everybody's looking for any reason to just be negative about anything because we just like being miserable as people is what I'm convinced of, right? But when we look at the theology of 1 Peter, yeah, it is similar to Paul. Do you know why it's similar to Paul? Same message. It's the same message. Thank you. <laughs> like, of course it's going to be similar because they're deriving it from the same source of truth. If they were different, we would have a problem. But what Peter focuses on in this section, or in this, this book, that his first letter that he writes, he focuses more on the Christian's experience as far as suffering is concerned. Okay? And he's going to announce that right off the bat in these verses. So let's read. We're going to read 3 through 10, and then we'll get to 11 and 12 uh, towards the end. So this is what he says, and I just want to read this again, because again, I've read this to you a number of times through different studies, but now we're actually going to break it down. He says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. In this, you what? Rejoice. Good, just want to make sure you're with me. But we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and what? Rejoice, Rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So first we're going to talk about this. He talks about, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. This is the first point that he's going to make. Blessed be God, which is what? Praise. Praise. Worship. He says we are worshiping and we are praising God. Why? Because according to his great mercy, he has what? Saved us. Saved us. Right. Yeah, that's a summary. But the, the wording that he uses is very specific. He's caused us to be born again. Where have we heard that terminology before? John 3.3. 3. 3. Thank you. And then ultimately John 3.16. When Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, 
right? Unless a man is born again, which is the whole point of salvation. I heard a pastor one time say that he got criticized and people would make fun of him because he was a born againer, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah, right. And we should be. You know why? Because if we weren't born again, we'd be dead in our trespasses. If we weren't born again, we would be, by nature, children of wrath, Paul says in Ephesians 2. So the fact that he has caused us to be born again is enough reason to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you have no other reason to worship, which there's plenty of reasons, but let's just boil this down. Some days it's really tough, right? I don't know about you, but Sunday mornings are always the craziest in my household. You never get up on time. The kids rarely listen. They definitely don't eat their breakfast until we get into the car, right? <laughs> So no matter how difficult that is, and no matter how unwilling you feel to worship at that point in time, there's still reason to praise. There's still reason to say, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again. If there is no other reason to praise, this is enough this is the reason so when we stand and we sing songs on sunday morning i don't care if you like the music or you don't like the music lift your voice because god saved you yes. Amen. i don't care if it's not a hymn i don't care if it's new praise it doesn't matter you know why because the name of god is being lifted up yes. and that alone is reason to praise but he's caused us to be born again to something. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope. Right. Now, a living hope means that it is active. It is not passive. It is something that we hope for and continually hope for. It's kept in heaven for us through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But notice the descriptions that he calls this hope. It is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That's where we got the title for our study, Imperishable Hope, in case you didn't make that connection. But that's what this letter is about. It is about imperishable hope. It is about our salvation. This inheritance that we have, we actually read about in the doctrine of last things. Because when John went to heaven in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5, what did John see in heaven? He saw a throne. He saw 24 elders. He saw angels surrounding that throne. And what was happening? Worship. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Right? That is the hope that we have. Now, if something is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, what does that make it? Eternal. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. Eternal. Everlasting. Right? Right? Isn't it Jesus that even says that you have this hope that where neither moth nor rust can destroy, right? That is the guarantee of our hope, our salvation, that we've been born again and are no longer citizens of this world and captives to sin, but citizens of heaven and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. That's worth hoping for. That's worth, as he says, rejoicing. Now, it's interesting, right? It's interesting that Paul and Peter specifically, when they talk about rejoicing, it's usually followed up with what? 
In this we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, we deal with trials. Right? Paul will say in Romans 5, rejoice in suffering. Why? Because suffering produces patience. And patience produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character, when it is realized, produces Hope. Hope, he says in Romans 5. It produces hope. It's really funny, right? Like, yeah, they kind of have the same theology. As they should. So let's talk about this. He says, uh, in this you rejoice, though now for... Well, hold on. I want to back up real quick. He says that this hope that we have, an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, is kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Okay? Who guards our salvation? God, not you. Okay? I want to be very clear on this. Yes, your salvation is given to you as a gift of faith. But it is not your responsibility to sustain it. That is too great of a power and too great of a pressure to put on yourself. You get a lot of people that go, oh man, I sinned, life is over. Uh-uh. Your salvation is guarded by the power of God. Which means when Jesus says that no man will be able to pluck you out of my hands. You know why? Because the hands that you're in are the hands that created the universe. Because the hands that you're in are the same hands that were nailed to a cross. So your salvation is guarded by that power. Your salvation is guarded. That inheritance that's undefiled, unfading, is guarded by that power. And it's our responsibility to them what? Worship. It's our responsibility to, when we do mess up, repent. It's our responsibility to continue to grow and become holy. He then goes on, he says, in this, in what? In this, the salvation, the hope that you have, you rejoice. Rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you are grieved by various trials. Anybody want to take a stab at how long a little while might be? Absolutely could be. It absolutely could be your entire life. Pilgrims passing through. It may not be your lifetime. It may only be a season. It may only be a little while. But that little while is undefined. And the reason why it's undefined is that it could be your life. Though now for a little while, maybe 70 years that we have on this earth, you still rejoice. Though you are tested or grieved by various trials. There's a picture here, right? We can, he, he gives us this example so that the tested genuineness of your faith, which is more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and the glory and the honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. How can we rejoice in trial? How can we rejoice in pain? Well, we know that that trial is a testing of our faith. But it's even more than that in the sense that it's a refining of our faith. It's not a test in the sense that you pass or you fail, but it is a test where pressure is added. When they refine gold, what do they do? They heat it up so that the impurities move to the surface and then they scrape it away. Well, I would venture to say that when you put pressure on that gold, that's a trial, right? There's a outside force working to bring the impurities to the top. 
which is the same picture that it gives us with faith, right? There's this pressure that's happening. There's this trial that's happening. And yet the impurities are being revealed and we repent from them and have them scraped away so that the genuineness of our faith can, can be made known, seen, yeah, sanctified, right? Well, we can think about this in another way too. Think about a mother giving birth to a child. There's pain. There's hardship. There's labor that is taking place, but yet there's rejoicing because life is being given. And so it is true with us in our faith and our trials. When we face trials, it's tough and there's pain and there's labor, but we can rejoice because life is being given, because faith is being tested because faith is being refined and ultimately we rejoice because our hope will never be taken away. Because our hope is unfading. And he goes, no, now you have not seen him. You love him. Though now you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and what? Rejoice. Rejoice. Catching a theme? But you rejoice with what? Joy. Joy. Very specific word choice. We talk about happiness when it comes to the Bible? No, because we don't care about your happiness. You know why? Because your happiness is an emotion that comes from your heart, which is deceptively wicked above all else. But joy comes from God. But joy comes from your hope that is undefiled, from your faith that is being refined. So we rejoice with joy, yeah. But don't you spell joy, Jesus, others, and then you spell that? I've heard that before. It's not incorrect. But yeah, I mean, joy is what comes from God. And ultimately, we are obtaining, he says, the outcome of our faith, the salvation of our souls. That's when our hope is finally realized, right? We've said this a number of times in these studies, and we will continue to say it, but now we see through a glass dimly. But when that hope is revealed, we will finally see the ultimate revealing of our salvation. Just think about that, right? Like Revelation 4, John standing before the throne. And in fact, when we read Revelation, the majority of those verses and chapters are about the throne of God anyways. Like that is... The hope that is undefiled is our gathering around the throne of God so that we can finally worship him in his presence, around his throne. Those who were once cosmic traitors being made citizens of the kingdom again. Right, that's, that's an image that hopefully can t continue to spur us on and can continue to give us this hope and reason for rejoicing, okay? So here's our last section, okay? Verse 10 through 12. He says, concerning this salvation, okay? We've just spent the majority of our time talking about this salvation. It is our hope. It is <laughs> from the riches of God's mercy, which has caused us to be born again, and it is the reason that we Worship. He says, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. What he's doing here is he's tying really the entirety of Scripture together, right? Because from Genesis 3.15, until we read the account of Jesus being born in the flesh, all of the Old Testament is going to point to this coming king. So when he talks about the prophets who prophesied and inquired about the time that this man would suffer, right? 
He's saying they didn't do that for themselves, but they did that for you. They did that so that they could say, hey, this Jesus from Nazareth, it's like Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. How do we know that? Well, because the prophets prophesied about it. Because Jesus goes into the temple and reads from Isaiah, closes it up and goes, this is now fulfilled. Like, think about that move for a second, right? Think about this guy coming into a temple, reading this section of Old Testament scripture about himself, rolling up the scroll and going, I'm here, right? That is a mic drop moment. It is one of those moments where you're like, if you're not paying attention, you're going to miss something. Oh, and then, by the way, how many times did Christ predict the fact that he was going to suffer and die with the disciples? Multiple, multiple times. So even them, they were, in a sense, prophets prophesying about this time that was then fulfilled, and now they're apostles writing it to us. Not for their benefit, but why? For our benefit. For the recipients of this letter, to be clear, okay, because that's who the letter is written for, these churches in these areas that he named, but also for our benefit. Because we can see that we have a hope that is imperishable. Why? Because Jesus suffered and died. Because it is through his death, burial, and resurrection that we are made alive. That's why we read passages like Philippians 2 where it talks about him emptying himself. And becoming obedient even to death on a cross. And it's written about for us and it's prophesied about for us. Why? So that we may obtain the hope that is imperishable, undefiled, and never fading away. But then he ends this section and we'll move on next week to the following section. He says these are the things which the angels long to look this message of salvation is a unique message to humanity. We're not, though creation is affected by our sin, we are the ones redeemed by the blood of Christ. This message isn't for angels. This message isn't for animals. The hope is for us. The message is for us. And it is a responsibility, he said in that section of Scripture, for preachers to what? Preach the good news. I don't know about you. I rarely watch the news. I usually read it when I feel like it. There's not much good news. Okay, Most news is bad news, right? They say no news is good news. And I think that's an actual, like, very literal statement except when we're talking about the fact that we were once alienated from the God of the universe and because his son lived the life we were intended to live and died the death we deserve to die, we now are made joint heirs. And there's a hope that is undefiled and never fading away that causes us to rejoice. And that's the message that we need to take to the world. That's the message that has to resonate with us the moment we step our feet on the floor in the morning. It should be the reason why we do what we do. Because as we've talked about in church history, the Westminster Confession says, what is our chief end as man? It is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We cannot do that if we have not first been born again and partaken of this hope. That's where we're going to end. Any questions? Nothing? All right. Give you some time back. Unlike last week where we went pretty long. Let's pray and then we will get out of here. God, we love you. We thank you for tonight. But most importantly, God, we thank you and praise you for the hope that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that you would be with us, that we would remember this hope, even though we're tested by various trials, that you would allow us the grace 
to get through them and the faith to withstand them. I thank you for your son and the death that he died so that we might live. And I pray that you would send your spirit to us to guide us each and every day and remind us to continually worship you. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen.